And good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath, and welcome to Sabbath School. Uh, we want to invite each one to go and uh, find their uh, lesson study and their Bible, and uh, come and join us uh, for lesson six of our uh, study this week. Uh, to get us started, why don't we begin with prayer? And so, Heavenly Father, we uh, bow our heads before you just to thank you for today, for your love and care and attention as we've gone through another week. Uh, dear Lord, we want to pray uh, for our church family, for those uh, uh, cares and concerns that uh, we're sure that you know about each one of us. We pray that you will uh, carry us now, that you will send your Holy Spirit now to be with us in our Sabbath school discussion with Mary Ann and I that you will uh, open our hearts and our minds as we uh, lead out in this discussion, but also you'll be at home with each one and uh, that we may uh, find things to, uh, for each one of us to think about, to talk about as uh, we read the Bible and, and uh, in our search to come closer to you. So to this end, we ask and pray all these things in Christ's loving name. And so, Marianne, uh, our title this morning is, Why is Interpretation Needed? And just to get us started, why don't you start us out uh, by reading uh, and uh, telling us the memory text? Well, Mark, because I am someone that has difficulty in understanding the King James Version, I have um, my Bible, which is the New Living Translation, and I'm going to read it. Um, out of there, Hebrews 11, 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. And so there's God working again, putting things in place so that our faith will grow and uh, in the New King James Version, it says, for those who diligently seek him. So I think uh, different words, but uh, for sure the same meaning. And so as we're uh, starting in on our uh, title, why is interpretation needed? I wanted to ask, first of all, what is interpretation? What is interpretation to you? Well, I had it to my dictionary, and it says it's the act of explaining the meaning of something. Okay. Well, our author tells us that to read the Bible also means to interpret the Bible. And so we can maybe ask ourselves, uh, how do we do that? Uh, what principles do we use? Uh, do we deal with different kinds of writing uh, we find here? For example, is the passage we're reading a parable, a prophetic symbolic dream. A parable uh, might be like as in a story that Christ was uh, making up uh, for the disciples, for his followers uh, that he gave uh, to in many situations so that they would be able to help to understand a situation that he was describing to them. A prophetic uh, symbolic dream, well, wasn't uh, uh, Daniel known for his prophetic uh, symbolic uh, dreams or a historical uh, narrative. I think perhaps uh, the stories of Moses or Joseph, perhaps those could be considered historical narratives. Um, but what we want uh, to look at is the question of the context of, strip of scripture involves an act of interpretation itself. As an example of that, Mark, and I'm not sure I shared this with you before um, we started studying this, when I was a young woman in my early 20s, I was about to get married um, to my first husband. His um, father took me aside. Now, what I knew of his father was that he was a monster in the home. So I trembled with fear when this man took me aside. But he held out the Bible in front of me and he said, pointing to Titus 2.5, see, it says here that a wife needs to be submissive to her husband. 
do you understand what that means? And I remember trembling and saying yes. And so I went into a marriage being submiss submissive to my husband. But as I continued to work and I gained more confidence in myself, I started to understand that maybe I was being submissive in a way that was not exactly what the Bible was saying. I had not studied for myself and perhaps if, my, if I had, and if my husband and I had sat down and studied it together, we could have saved ourselves a divorce and a whole lot of heartache. Yeah, well our lesson study talks about your example uh, it talks about the context. And it even tells us in the bottom sentence there, or bottom paragraph, any text without context quickly becomes a pretext for one's own agenda and ideas. How very true. And I think you were the victim of uh, someone's agenda and ideas. How very true. So we go on to Sunday's lesson and it is about presuppositions. So Mark, what is a presupposition? Presupposition is to have an idea about something before a discussion or before a reading or before, before anything begins. It's your own idea of how things might be before even talking about it with somebody else. Uh, we learned in, uh, or we perhaps were reminded in Luke uh, 24, that the disciples, they had their own uh, uh, presuppositions that they had to deal with. And it was while they were with Jesus. Uh, Jesus had told them that uh, as he went about uh, healing people and teaching the people, that he would also be tortured and crucified. And then on the third day, uh, he would rise from the dead. The disciples, as much as they loved to hear the teaching and, and see the healing, they didn't hear the, the part about Christ being crucified and, or tortured and then crucified. And so it, when they actually seen it happen, they were crushed. And they, were, um, they very much had forgotten that Christ would uh, rise from the dead on the third day, as he did. And so then they were very much surprised. But yet Christ had told them that all these things were going to happen. And these kinds of things had taken um, the disciples so off guard because they were, now to their defense, they were at the time living under the Roman rule. And the Romans were, uh, could we say, somewhat dictatorial. They were, they were rough and tough in their enforcement of the law. And the people generally were not happy living underneath Roman rule. And so they seen, the te uh, they seen Jesus as somebody coming to set them free from this war Roman rule. And they seen through the healing and through the teaching that it was just a matter of time till Christ would rise up and free them from this dictatorship. But it wasn't that way at all. And you see, we all hold a number of beliefs about this world, about ultimate reality. Uh, ultimate reality about God, etc., that we presuppose or accept even unwittedly or subconsciously when we interpret the Bible. You see, no one approaches the biblical text with an empty mind. How true. But yet, total neutrality or absolute objectivity cannot be achieved, that is, Bible study and theological reflection always happen against the background of presuppositions about the nature of the world and the nature of God. You see, we have to learn to let these presuppositions go in our reading of God's Word. And, and that's why, Mark, it's so important that when we, when we open up God's written Word, that we ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and open our minds so that we have a clear understanding of the scriptures. And in fact, that is the really good news, that the Holy Spirit can open up and correct our limited perspectives and presuppositions mm -hmm. when we read the words of scripture with an open mind 
an honest heart. You see, we're even told that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth coming from John 16, 13. And you see, we have to see the Holy Spirit as kind of a guiding light as we read through the words of Scripture. So as we turn the page to Monday's part of the lesson, uh, what's your take on translation and interpretation? Well, certainly the early scriptures were either written in Hebrew, Aramaic, or in Greek. Now, when I did my research for this uh, particular lesson, I found out that there are now 208 different translations and in 68 languages. We know that in many of this, these languages that there isn't a word that translates exactly into English. So there is room for certainly um, error if we don't proceed in the right way. Now there is an art and skill of carefully translating and then interpreting text and it is called hermonics. Um, and I think we can look at Jesus as being the teacher, the main teacher of this, because he frequently had to explain to his disciples uh, the scriptures and what it said. And I think about Jesus when he um, came out of the tomb. He was on his way to Aramatus and there ran into two other people who were talking about what had happened in Jerusalem in the last three days. And it ended up that Jesus uh, taught them the scriptures from Moses up until it included himself. Um, if we could, uh, if I can key in on that, it tells us that the key purpose of hermeneutics is to convey accurately the meaning of Bible text and to help us know how to apply properly the text teaching in our lives right. now. Right. So it's something that we can take into our lives now. Now. And uh, as you uh, were describing the her hermeneutics, it made me think, wouldn't a Berman University love to have Jesus on their staff? <laughs> I would think so. As the uh, uh, class instructor on hermeneutics. I would think so. Tuesday's lesson uh, talks to us about the Bible and culture. Now, in, uh, in Acts, we find Paul is in uh, Greece. And he's going around and, and telling people about Jesus as he knew Jesus. And uh, in fact, uh, the Greeks had lots of uh, philosophers and, and uh, were much interested in what Paul had to say to the point where after a while they even asked uh, Paul to preach to them about Jesus Christ. And uh, so Paul, in his um, uh, classical way to, uh, to reach the Greeks, he had, uh, he had noticed as he went from place to place, well, he probably spent a lot of time in Athens, and uh, he had actually found an altar in Athens that talked about uh, to an unknown God. Because the Greeks had all kinds of altars to all kinds of different gods, uh, one for every occasion sort of thing. And just in case they couldn't find an altar for an occasion that they came upon, they made one, uh, an altar to an unknown God. So Paul took advantage of this uh, situation that he's seen and he said, so I have uh, found, I know, I know the God of uh, the unknown altar. I know the unknown God of the altar that you have uh, here in Athens. And uh, his son is Jesus Christ and so on. He went to tell the Greeks. Now, he came upon uh, an interesting point, or our author has come across, across an interesting part that Paul presented. And it comes to us in Acts 17, 26. 
And it reads, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So Paul, the Apostle Paul gives us an interesting perspective on reality that is often overlooked when people read this text. He states that God made us all from one blood. And while we are culturally very diverse, like my culture, for example, is uh, I come from Scotland, uh, I understand you're, uh, you have some German blood flowing through your brain's you bet. Brain, uh, body. I understand that we have a few Ukrainians scattered about mm -hmm. in our uh, Penticton church family. And, uh, well, I don't know if we have any Greeks or not, but uh, who knows what we might have if we were to ask more people. So the truth is, while we are culturally very diverse, biblically speaking, there is a common bond that unites all people. And despite their cultural differences, and that's because God is the creator of all humanity, our sinfulness and our need of salvation is not limited to one culture. We all need the salvation offered to us by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so a parallel that has been given to us in our lesson uh, is a mathematical parallel, comes uh, uh, fr to us from algebra. Now algebra is uh, the study of uh, letters uh, that represent numbers. Uh, you might remember back in uh, your class. Oh, yes, I never classes, liked it. <laughs> yeah, where you had 2x plus 3x or times 3x equals 5x. Well, that is algebra, and it, it was invented in the 9th century A.D. in Baghdad. And uh, does this mean that the truths and the principles of this branch of mathematics are limited only to that time in Baghdad and place? Well, of course not. Hmm. The same principle applies to the truth of God's Word. Though the Bible was written a long time ago and cultures very different from ours today, the truths it contains are as relevant to us now as they were to whom they were first addressed. Going on to our next section, our sinful and fallen nature. And it comes from John 9, 39 to 41, and John 12, 42 to 43. And the question here is what hindered the people in these passages from accepting the truth of the biblical message? And what words of warning and caution can we take away from these incidents for ourselves? Well, certainly we remember um, Jesus talking about the Pharisees as being blind. However, they thought that they could see. Um, we also understand that there were Jews who believed in Jesus, and yet they kept it all to themselves because they liked human praise more than God's praise. How very sad. It says that instead we should approach the Bible in faith and submission and not with an attitude of criticism and doubt. Pride, self-deception, and doubt lead to an attitude of distance towards God and the Bible that will surely lead to disobedience. That is an unwillingness to follow God's revealed will. Okay, so that puts us to Thursday. And, uh, well, the question is asked, why interpretation is important? And I wanted to insert there on my own why interpretation is needed and important. But anyway, the author didn't give me a call on that one, so maybe we'll leave my words out. In any case, in Nehemiah 8, uh, where uh, the question is asked, why is a clear understanding of scripture so important for us, not only as individuals, but as a church? Mm -hmm. And so we must uh, think about in our end time events uh, that we uh, claim that we're living in mm -hmm. uh, very often in our discussions, particularly when we can be together. 
we uh, talk about perhaps having to go to court to uh, tell what we believe. And for sure, we're, uh, we've been uh, told and taught that someday we'll all stand before Jesus by ourselves. So a clear understanding of scripture is very important. And another thing that is brought to our attention in the lesson is the most important question in the Bible is the question of salvation. And in fact, how are we saved? And is that not a ver the very, um, could we say very nature yes. and business of the church? Uh, but you see, but to know what the Bible teaches about salvation depends very much on interpretation. If we approach and interpret the Bible wrongly, we will likely come to false conclusions, mm -hmm. not just in the understanding of salvation, but in everything else the Bible teaches. In fact, even in the time of the apostles, theological error had already crept into the church, no doubt. Uh, what could we say, encouraged by false interpretations of Scripture. And I'm sure the Pharisees are being blamed for that uh, on a regular basis. The question is also asked, uh, coming from Second Peter, what does this tell us about how important a correct reading of Scripture, of scripture is? Well, when we talk about the health of the church, we want to be talking about a correct reading of Scripture. Because what if somebody new came into our church, Mary Ann, mm -hmm. and they asked you a question, oh, perhaps about but baptism, or who knows what the question might have been about. And, and I give my interpretation of what I think it means. And so then, after that, they come and they talk to me, and coincidentally, they ask a very similar question. And what if I give a slightly... Uh, a uh, different answer to that question. I guess if it's just slightly different, that might not be so bad, but what if it's radically different? Mm -hmm. And then it just happens, they walk down the hallway a little ways, and they bump into the pastor and get talking with him, and they ask an, the same question of him, and he gives yet another description. Mm -hmm. I don't think the her, the, uh, that our church or the health of our church would be considered very good at a, that time. We, sure, we certainly wouldn't look like we had it together, would we? No. So we want to be saying there can be no unity of doctrine and teaching unless our interpretation of Scripture uh, is theologically correct. A bad and distorted uh, theology inevitably leads to a deficient and distorted mission. And after all, we have a message to give to the world but are confused about the meaning of the message, how efficiently will we be able to present this message to those who need to hear it? Right. And so Friday starts us out. Uh, go, I meant to uh, tell, you, uh, tell you, go ahead in your, uh, with the first paragraph there and tell us what that says. As the humble seeker for truth sits at Christ's feet and learns of him, the word gives him understanding. To those who are too wise in their own conceit to study the Bible, Christ says, you must become meek and lowly in heart if you desire to become wise into salvation. And the second paragraph goes on to tell us, do not the read the word in the light of former opinions, but with a mind free from prejudice. Search it carefully and prayerfully. If as you read, conviction comes and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, do not try to make the word fit these opinions, but make your opinions fit the word. Do not allow what you have believed or practiced in the past to control your understanding. Open the eyes of your mind to behold wondrous things out of the law. Find out what is written, and then plant your feet on the eternal rock. Amen. And so I say thank you all for coming and studying with us, and uh, I want to wish each one a happy Sabbath and a fantastic week. Happy Sabbath. Keep safe.